In fact, you sent me some remarkable information. And we're going to expand on this story. Uh, we want to talk about the fact in the ancient world, the position of the North Pole changed significantly because the lithosphere, the crust, moves on the mantle. And it moves in actually quite a significant distance. And in fact, even reports going back to uh, the so-called inventor of the theory of evolution uh, has it in his notes. And if you look at the ancient world in terms of the ancient temples, they all pointed to the North Pole. And where they converge actually in the ancient world, I think about six or 7,000 years ago, was actually in the south part of Baffin Island. Uh, there was a period of time in the very ancient world where, in fact, the convergence was to the open ocean, which meant basically the amount of ice was significantly less, so the sea level was much higher than uh, even today. So what we have to understand is that the poles move, not only the magnetic poles, but the physical poles, because the crust of the earth slides on the mantle. And it moves over a period of actually probably months, in fact, uh, it can move as much as twelve to 1,600 miles over a period of time. It does it on periodically, and it's probably tied to galactic and solar events, and I'll, I'll speculate on what I think are the main factors in that. But let's go through this. You have an article here called, Do Ancient Sites Point to the Old North Pole? Uh, and, of course, it shows your name and your email address. We can go over that. And let's go over some of the latest research you've done, Mark, because this is significant, and I'll explain at the end of the story as we get into later segments of the show why it's so significant because, and I'll just give you a little hint, this event of a pole shift is going to be the primary thing that's going to end the New World Order and be one of the events to cleanse the earth of evil is the pole shift. Okay? So let's get into it and explain all of this stuff about the ancient pole movement. In fact, I think you showed on your previous show we did that the direction of the North Pole pointed to Alpha Draconis, which is the dragon star in the belt of Orion, and uh, since the time of both Jesus, it actually points toward a different star sign that points toward something that looks much more like, you know, the re return of God in the flesh to Earth, which is not the uh, Alpha Draconis star system, etc. So there's lots of cool things that are going on in these signs in the heavens. And the changes on Earth are actually not insignificant. In fact, I found my research, this is long before you mentioned this, that 9 million years ago, Alaska was on the equator. Wow. So things are a lot different than what people think. In Antarctica, the ancient map maker, Americo Bospesi, had maps from Alexandria that were transferred to Rome. And those maps were in the ancient pre-Adamic world. And in fact, uh, Antarctica did not exist at the South Pole. In fact, that's why the Nazis who researched this went to Neuschwabenland, which is in German, is basically in the South Pole. And they discovered ancient temples and pyramids and so on. So there's a lot more to the world than people think, and it's a lot different than what these so-called teachers in high school or in the so-called churches teach, isn't it? So, uh, Mark, let's get into it. Sure. Uh, very happy to be with you. Where do you want me to start? I mean, it's a huge field. <clears throat> I, want you to, I want you to get in the start of, number one, why were you curious to, to discover this in the first place? And then last time you were so excited you had to do more research for, I think, a month or two before we even came back because you were kind of tracking down new research about the positions of ancient sites like the Nazca Lines in, in South America. And ancient temples are pointing toward the North Pole because it's one of the signs, even, the, for example, the Stonehenge in England and these other ancient uh, sacrificial sites like the mound sites that go back 65, 70,000 years, long before the native peoples moved here, uh, and the serpentine sites, and so in the ancient temples, they all almost all had some kind of alignment in their temple with the North Pole, didn't they? Well, human be humans, uh, we tend to line up our cities and structures to the uh, <clears throat> a north-south uh, grid, you know, uh, and apparently every civilization before us has also done this. Right. However, when uh, <clears throat> it's very curious that the... Uh, most of the most of the ancient sites in Central America are skewed east of north, so they're off this grid. Right. They're not on this north south grid. Right. Some are, but many are not. Most of them are not in the Central America. And the question is, why? Well, um, I was down in uh, South America last October, about a year ago. And I was very happy to discover <clears throat> when we visited Tiwanaku, this ancient site on the south end of Lake Titicaca, to discover that archaeolo archaeologic 
let me start again. Archaeologists have excavated the uh, two of those ancient sites down there at Tiwanaku. Uh, one is Puma Punku, and the other is the uh, Pyramid of Akapana. Uh, and both of these <clears throat> both of these ancient pyramids had been covered with a mud flow. Some uh, ancient cataclysm had wiped out the site, but they dug down and they were able to expose the original foundations for both of these. <clears throat> and guess what? They're both intact. So both the foundations were intact, which will enable us to get a an alignment for the Akapana. And when I plotted that alignment uh, this past, well, last uh, winter, uh, I was amazed to just to find that it aligns uh, it lines up with uh, the pyramids of Mexico near Mexico City, Teotihuacan. Right. Uh, they cross the lines cross over uh, Baffin Island, and there's a third uh, site from Egypt, ancient Egypt, that crosses very close to that also. And that was one of the uh, discoveries I made just starting on. There's just been so many of them. This is a virgin field right now, thanks to the uh, this new mapping technology, I say new, it's been around for a few years, but uh, Google Earth has been made available, uh, freely available for only a couple of years now. But we can use this technology to ma accurately map uh, the surface of the Earth. Right. It's very interesting, very helpful. Right. Now, where is this significant? Because why do you think... Um, at this time in history, again, I don't believe anything happened by chance. Uh, and I'll explain the structure of the universe a little bit so people understand that. First off, there's a portion of human beings that involves three different realms. We have a physical body that lives in the realm of entropy, which is uh, time, space, and to change the of energy so we can have decay or aging. There's a portion of us that exists in what's called the spirit or the realm of consciousness or in the anthropic realm where the order of the necantropic comes into the, the entropic world and creates uh, order out of the chaos. And then finally, there's a an order of what we call the hyperdimensional realm, which is beyond time, space, and dimensions, which is also a portion of us. There's a seed atom of us and that's the same as the creator god of the universe. So there's an eternality in all of us. At the same time, there's a temporality and a hyperdimensional reality. Now, what happens is all of us get inspiration. It doesn't matter what religion you are. And all of us have some entropic or empathy. And if you talk to the native people or anybody in religion, they'll tell you that they talk about the spirit god of the mountain and the trees and whatever. Everything's got some energy and intelligence. Okay? And when there's a convergence of things into, a, into the realm of, of consciousness, which is coming through you and through others that I've talked to, and it's the time for us to become aware of this because this is starting to happen. And I'll just give you a few factoids. Uh, 4,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago, the, the Schumann resonance of the Earth was 4,000 times stronger. And I've actually been able to calculate and actually be able to generate what's called the Sabathodenic frequency that in the ancient world caused people to be not only giants, but also to live 900 years plus. And that field has dropped since the Babylonian times 30 times. So 23, 2,700 years ago, the fields dropped around 30 times. Now, there's two North Poles and two South Magnetic Poles now. And there's a South Pole anomaly where basically there's a hole in the geomagnetosphere that's about 1,000 miles across near Antarctica. And if you go 22,000 miles near the Van Allen radiation belt, our layer 1, 2, and 3, it's five times the diameter of Earth. Now, that means there's no protection in that particular zone of incoming X-rays, cosmic rays, and zeta particles. None. So if you fly a plane through that, it's going to knock out your navigation and communication ability. And the Russians discovered this, and so the people in South America, most people aren't aware of it, because I took care of people working on a classified project, so I'm aware. Now, why is that important? It's because the rate at which the North Pole is magnetically moving, and, and the way it moves around like in a big circle and comes back, has dramatically been increasing, and it's also weakening. So the, the Earth's magnetic field, and they, they figured out how to make the Earth's geomagnetic field by making what's called a torsion field generator. And they did it uh, in a zinc mine in North Bay, Ontario, about 10 years ago. And what they discovered is a way of actually taking the, the Earth as a nuclear reactor and circulating the nuclear isotopes around a solid 
iron core and it actually created what's called a geomagnetic uh, torsion field, which is we call the magnetosphere. It's the actual movement of flux lines of energy into space that block radiation and reflect, uh, um, for example, the particles come from the heliosphere of the sun, which are helium-3, which are the molecules that crystallize in the surface of the moon that we use for helium-3 for tokamak fusion reactors that actually can convert and make plasma. It's actually a plasma nuclear reactor, which I know how to make, right? And I've actually talked about this on the show for about 12 years, until two years ago, Lockheed Martin talked about this. So what we have now is Earth changes are speeding up toward a transition point. Now, there's some evidence that there's a linkage between uh, solar minimum and solar changes and major Earth flips. Now, I don't know if this is all completely proven, but when you have a coronal mass ejection from the sun, the first thing that hits us before the actual plasma or even the ultraviolet light is a gravity wave. We actually get hit with a time-space distortion before the plasma or the ultraviolet light even hits us. Now, when you have a tectonic plate, it has a specific resonant field. And if you hit that resonant field with the right resonant field, the mu or resistance of the rock phases drops to zero. So I mentioned this yesterday in the show, and we got a ton of hits, over, by the way, overnight. And Deborah Tavares, I explained some of the science, which is classified, on how they've converted the upper atmosphere using the HARP project and thorium, strontium, barium, and aluminum nanoparticles. So they can not only steer storm cells, but they can also trigger off earthquakes and volcanoes. So a lot of the weather we have now is not due to global warming, it's due to global manipulation by maniacs who are doing things like causing droughts and triggering off earthquakes and doing weird stuff to cause heat inversions in the middle of the winter or, you know, Santa Ana's and dry winds and doing other things like the the, the meddlesome super of firestorms occurring in Northern California. Why is this important? It's because the globalists have literally weaponized Earth as part of a project that's part of what's called the Matrix, believe it or not. Now, they eventually want to hack into your human consciousness and actually not only know where you are, but know the intentions of your heart and your thoughts. And they want to have bi-directional control of the human race like will be in a cyber cage. And you can literally wear a helmet or a headband and go into cyberspace. People, oh, no, they can't do that. I said, you're an idiot, and they are going to soon be able to do it. They're working on it for decades now, and they're using the best minds they can get their evil minds, not the best minds, but the best evil minds they can actually get to do on it because they tried to recruit me 42 years ago to work with it with DARPA at UCLA. So uh, I want people to understand that the pole shift is one of the most important significant events in the coming future. I'm not going to give you a date. I don't know when it is, but I can tell you it's going to terminate a lot of the crap going on Earth. A lot of the globalism, a lot of the uh, crazy environmentalism, stuff like that, a lot of the things that are going on are going to be terminated by a pole shift. And I've actually had visions of exactly how far the pole will shift, and we've already seen parts of that movement kind of foreshadowing where it will go, and it's going to move North America 1,200 miles south over a period of two months, and so the equator will pass to Havana, Cuba, not South America. All right? That means most of the southern United States will be in a tropical or subtropical region. It also means most of the coastal areas will be hit with tsunamis. There'll be earthquakes all over the planet, and a lot of the areas that you think are relatively safe are going to have some major quakes that are going to occur. And if you're near a nuclear reactor that doesn't have proper quake protection, you're going to get a lot of radiation from these reactors that are not properly protected against large earthquakes. You don't want to be downwind of one of these damn things when this hits. People are not prepared for that. They're not prepared for things like the lake above the caldera in um, in uh, Yellowstone because that water is the real danger, not the magma. If the water gets down, the steam will cause a magma explosion, a pyroplastic explosion will be mind-boggling. Like the one that occurred in uh, the Dead Sea that FICO told me about back when I was there in 1999 that caused a massive explosion at the time of Abraham and Lot. That was a pyroplastic explosion caused by water. And he told me this. Okay, so you need to know what you're teaching is the most important thing, event that's going to change the future history of planet Earth. Pole shift. 
Do you have difficulty taking supplements? Are you searching for a high-quality, complete nutritional drink that your whole family will love? Nutramedical's Life Support has arrived. All of your daily nutritional requirements in one quick, delicious drink. Dr. Bill Deagle's Life Support is a proprietary blend of vegan protein, activated vitamins, essential minerals, amino acids, probiotics, green tea, digestive enzymes, anti-inflammatories, cancer prevention, detoxification, and much more. Your body will high-five you for this one. Life Support is the best complete nutritious meal replacement on the market. Whether you are an elite athlete, have post-operative challenges, chronic illness, elderly, or a family that just wants a quick, delicious drink, try Dr. Bill Deagle's Life Support for optimized nutrition in one great tasting smoothie. Just add cold water, almond milk, fruit, or anything else you like. Nutramedical's Life Support. Try our great tasting chocolate or vanilla today. Call 888-212-8871 or visit us online at Nutramedical.com. Nutramedical.com for the whole family. Legacy Emergency Foods is the top recommendation from Dr. Bill Deagle for the lowest oxygen concentration, the largest entrees, the highest amount of protein, the most varied entrees as well, and the longest food storage life. Nothing like Legacy Emergency Foods, and if you place a regular monthly order, you get 20% off and free shipping. Do get emergency foods for your supply for preparation and get it from Legacy Foods. Contact Dr. Bill Deagle for the link at Nutramedical.com. Go to the Shop by Products link and drop down message at Nutramedical.com and then place your orders for regular emergency food for yourself and your family. Nothing like emergency food if the power goes out and you can't go to grocery stores or if there's an emergency or a national crisis. So Nutramedical.com, top recommendation, Legacy Foods. Nutramedical.com, go to the Shop by Products and drop down menu and stay well with Nutramedical every day of your life. Lumen Photon Therapy, infrared light, far and near infrared is extremely important for pain control, simulation of nitric oxide, improved perfusion, and stem cell activation and reduction of cytokines. Dr. Bill uses it for pain control, for regeneration techniques, for organ regeneration, and for stimulation of your stem cell activity. Uh, this amazing uh, lumen photon therapy this year will probably have an additional device with frequency therapy during the on phase of the lights. To obtain a lumen photon machine, contact Dr. Bill at Nutramedical.com, 888 212 He'll prescribe it with you, providing nutraceuticals to help with your regeneration, healing, and pain control. Nothing like the lumen photon therapy for uh, easy therapy for your eyes, your pain, your joints, regeneration of organs, detoxification of the body. Get a lumen photon machine from Dr. Bill Deagle, Nutramedical.com, 888-212-8871. To stay well with Nutramedical. The Sonic Life Machine is one of the most amazing therapies that Dr. Bill provides. It is the best sine wave exercise machine on the planet, doing whole body vibration, opening up the muscle to reduce insulin resistance, improve perfusion, release stem cell therapies throughout the body, and epigenetically stimulate the body to release DNA activated. Uh, the epigenetic therapy with the uh, sine wave curve of frequencies given for atomic resonance but Linus Pauling for minerals and amino acids stimulates the production of messenger RNA to correct structural protein enzyme deficiency for almost every illness. There's nothing like the sine wave therapy for improving body healing for exercise but also the epigenetic treatments Dr. Bell can provide can help neutralize frequencies for disease states and illness. Get a Sonic Life machine through Dr. Bill Deagle at Nutramedical.com. Contact us at Nutramedical.com, 888-212-8871, or go to the website Nutramedical and give us a contact. Dr. Bill is available to help you get well with Nutramedical. Need a powerful ally to fight daily bugs and serious pathogens? Allison Med is the powerful universal pathogen killer's latest advance of German-sourced Allison, enzymatically stabilized to clear the body of bacteria, fungi, mycobacteria, and parasites. It penetrates body biofilms and is non-toxic to tissues. Pathogen resistance cannot develop for long-term body-optimized wellness. Clear stealth pathogens that promote autoimmune disease, cancer, and vascular inflammation and plaque and promote healing of tissues. Now pathogen-free. With 200 milligrams more power than prior Alamed, you can't get a more powerful ally to fight daily bugs and serious pathogens. Give your body what it needs. Allison Med. Order Dr. Bill Deagle's Nutridine at 888-212-8871 or Nutramedical.com. That's 1-888-212-8871 or Nutramedical.com. And listen to the Nutramedical Report on the Genesis Radio Network with open lines every weekday. Nutramedical.com, bringing nutrition and medicine together.
Mark, and explain okay. these papers are pretty dang amazing. So give us all the info, please. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, let's get let's start talking about the Nazca line. That's probably the most exciting part. Right. Yeah, the Nazca lines, which are, of course, you hear about, uh, remember that guy that talked about the uh, chariots of the gods? Please continue. What? Remember the guy that wrote the book about chariots of the gods, right? He talked about the Nazca oh, lines. Sure. You, can only, you can only see them basically from space or an aircraft flying over it, right? <clears throat> That's when we discovered them. We, uh, they were unknown until the airplane uh, was invented. Right. you got to be up above them to see them. <clears throat> Right. <clears throat> and some of these lines are uh, uh, animal figures. They're very complex uh, <clears throat> designs, uh, kind of whimsical. You know, the uh, you have uh, butterflies and monkeys, and there's a heron and a and a, you know various birds, uh, and I think there's a dog maybe, but. Then there's these a whole another set of lines that are just just straight vertical uh, horizontal lines extending for many miles across the Altiplano, just straight as an arrow. Right. So uh, what are they? Well, uh, I've found four of these lines are aligned to former pole positions. Right. So I'm I'm at the point now where I think that these are not random at all. They're every one of them is pointing to something. They're all significant, but it's going to take a long time, I think, for us to figure out exactly what each one of these lines, uh, what is its significance. You know, we're going to. It's going well, to take well, a let, time. let me give you some. Uh, you know, I, I tell people every anomaly is an answer to a question we haven't asked yet. And I've, I've tried to think about this for a few years about Nazca lines. And here's a couple of the questions, not the answers, but the questions they have. Is there a possibility that these lines are lined up with uh, harvest and planting dates so that you would actually be able to, to get food or specific time when certain animals are available or is best time to harvest those animals? Yes. And if you actually talk to the people that are the high priests of any country, whether it's Central America, South America, or elsewhere in the Middle East, the high priests already knew these star signs and would use the calendars, in fact, monitoring. That's why they talk about astrology. Astrology wasn't just kind of telling the future. It was telling the present and looking at the star signs to tell them when it was right to try to plant or to harvest or whatever. So be, my guess would be these specific lines were lined up specific with, with different uh, star signs in heaven in which they had their own interpretation of and would also signify to them when it was best to harvest or to plant or different types of crops and so on or to proceed with certain things in other words they use some, some form of collective astrology because you got to understand that the universe is basically a hologram and the information is imprinted into the hologram of the universe for example we talked about this with Jonathan Gray so I, I would make a guess at the very least it has a lot to do with agriculture and uh, survival of that culture. What do you think? Well, um, I think... That's just a guess. That's only a I guess. I really think that these lines uh, indicate a presence going back a couple hundred thousand years. Who knows how far back? And I suspect that this high civilization, they were there the, continuously over this period, time frame, I'm convinced. Right. And I believe they mapped out all the different earth changes that took place over that time frame. We oh, yeah, can, absolutely, we absolutely. Dozens of different pole positions being represented by these lines. Yeah, Dr. these, these. by the way, the people of the mounds, the mounds we're going to have on uh, this Thursday, uh, Ali Marzulli, and the mound builders are anywhere between... Uh, 35 and 75,000 years ago. They're long before the native people came. The first thing that Director of Space Command said to me and Dr. Ogrodnik was we control every cubic centimeter between here and space. This was July 10th, 1994, right, in the morning. And I said, you mean the morning? And he said, shut the F up, Deagle. This is a come to Jesus talk. And I'll tell you, between that and other things for over years, I was told or shown my worldview, my view of the universe is completely different than basically anybody in the so-called mundane world that watches NBC and CNN and Fox. 
The first, one of the first things he said is when we went to Mars, we found ancient human monuments going back half a million years. Yeah. And in proof of civilization there, at least half a million years on Mars. In other words, it's possible, I'm not going to say this is an absolute, it's very possible that we actually originated on Mars or even some distant planet in a distant past and we're in a sense colonists. And in fact, the colony on Earth survived an ancient galactic war because I have proof that Mars and the atmosphere was stripped off in an ancient galactic war probably between 13 and 35,000 years ago. In fact, one of the remnants of that ancient civilization is the Dark Knight satellite in polar orbit, five times bigger than the International Space Station in polar orbit. So people need to realize that these ancient civilizations not only had advanced science, they had even genetic engineering, space travel, air travel, they had all kinds of stuff that we don't even think we have. In fact, we couldn't build the pyramids even with our current technology. So it was ancient civilizations and anti-gravitonic and other technology to build the pyramids, which we could not reproduce today. So in some ways, their civilizations at higher levels of some technology, including Tesla mentioned this, about transmitting power through the air. In fact, his test site was in Colorado Springs, and he was fighting Edison about the idea of not even having to lay towers, but transmitting power through the air for the entire planet. So. The ancient world was quite a bit different than what people think, and some of the technology they had was higher than we have today. People don't want to accept that, do they? Well, there's no doubt in my mind that these Nazca lines are extremely accurate. Right. Uh, they're more accurate than a lot of the archaeological sites. Uh, uh, you know, some of the, the the accuracy varies a lot. It varies widely from from site to site. Some of them right. are accurate. And others are off quite a bit. But these Nazca lines, over and over again, they, they seem to line up almost perfectly with the uh, pole positions. Right. And by the way, there's not just one pole position. Is there more than one pole position they line up with? Well, I've found at least four of these lines that, that are uh, pointing to former pole positions. At least right. four. Right, so more, more than one. In other words, they're over long periods of time, like tens of thousands of years is what you're saying. That's right, and this points to their uh, presence, a continuous presence of this high civilization on our planet. They were here for a very long time. Exactly. In fact, we're going to talk about this tomorrow with L.A. Marzulli, about the people with the elongated skulls and all the other stuff and the giants and everything. What people need to start realizing, we, if you take the Drake equation, you know, I'm, I'm talking about this as a fact, and we have a relatively small spiral galaxy. The Drake equation predicts that over the last billion years, that there should be at least 100 million civilizations at or above our current level right now in the last billion years, just in our little galaxy. And there's more galaxies in the universe than grains of sand on every beach and every ocean or lake in the world. So if people think that there's not advanced civilizations that are thousands, if not millions of years older than us, they're morons. Of course there is. And most of these beings and so on, and we also know about panspermia. Panspermia theory, which has been around since the Middle Ages, it's very logical. We even see asteroids and so on to indicate that there's life forms like bacteria on Mars. They want to colorize the sky. Oh, the sky is yellow or red or whatever. No, it's not. Blue light, if you're even if it's a thin atmosphere, is going to look blue. So if you're on the surface of Mars, they colorize it so they don't want you to even speculate that maybe there's life on Mars or that maybe there's life on distant worlds that are many light years from us, some of it human or non-human. And in fact, we're not living in a, in, we're in a lonely area. We're living in an area where our civilization is so low in culture, we can't even detect these beings that are traveling at, at faster than light or other types of technology that we can't detect. Except for things like infrared, for example. I was up at a conference about seven years ago in Los Angeles, and they showed me a special infrared camera, and there was so much traffic in the sky, you'd think it was an L.A. freeway. It was nuts. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, what am I seeing? And I thought, yeah, I know what I'm seeing. And of course, having worked at Space Command, I know things are a lot weirder than people want to even believe. And they're even weirder than so-called, you know, Star Wars or the Trilogy of the Rings. The real universe and the real world is a lot more interesting, a lot more wonderful and dangerous than people think, isn't it? Well, I've always said uh, reality is stranger than, than fiction, you know. Exactly. And, yeah. and the problem is we don't have an open mind. See, I'm like a three-year-old child who keeps asking questions. 
And you're never going to get wise unless you get stupid. And you don't get stupid if you don't ask questions, empty out your mind to the point where you don't really know anything. And then you realize you start asking questions that are basically are trying to see if you get the best question to pour the question on an anomaly or a paradox like what you picked up. And you realize that it's not the answers you're seeking. It's better questions to explain a paradox you found. You already found the paradox of the Nazca lines. So where is this going now? You found other sites. Like we talked about this a few months ago. You noticed a lot of these were converging in South Baffin Island. Uh, you mentioned to me on the weekend when we were talking that there's a one period of time was about a hundred and some thousand years ago where the convergent lines were out in the oceans, like the North Sea, right? Well, uh, I've been studying, in ten, you know, the last 120,000 years. Right. Uh, we had a interglacial event 120,000 years ago. They call it the Enian, highest sea level uh, of the entire Pleistocene. And the reason was because, and I figured this out, at that time, both the pole positions, north and south, were over the ocean. Right. So, so you wouldn't have a, you wouldn't have a giant amount of ice like over over land, like Antarctica or let's say Baffin Island, right? That's right. So we didn't get ice formation uh, over a continent. So we had very high sea levels. Makes sense to me. And then, of course, yes. you remember? Do you know the group people called the people of Doggerland? They're the people yes. we later called the Vikings and so on. In fact. Around, I think it's uh, in the uh, glacial period and about 12,000 years ago, there was enough ice in uh, over Greenland or over the North Pole area, the land area, and over Antarctica that the water level was so low that it was actually a land bridge directly from Scotland to Norway and and, and uh, Europe. And, and they were totally connected. They were not separated at all. In fact, the idea that there's a kind of a, a land bridge across, let's say, the strait from from uh, you know uh, the the cliffs of Dover to France, th these things were open. People went back and forth like it was nothing, and they called these ancient peoples twelve, thirteen thousand years ago, which later became the Vikings, and the people from Norway, like my name Deagle is a Norwegian name. These are the people of Doggerland. They call it right, Doggerland. Doggerland was that uh, eventually flooded when the, we had sea level right. rise. That uh, exactly. When the, uh, you know, the last ice cap over North America melted uh, right. during that time frame that you mentioned. But right. at that time, uh, when we had the land bridge, there was also a land bridge between Alaska and Siberia at the same time. So exactly. we had a steppe grassland with uh, a mammoth, huge mammoth herds roaming all the way from England to Alaska, right across Asia. Yeah, let, let, let me give you a little story here. One of my friends in high school... Very brave guy, kind of an interesting, cool guy. He worked with the Bedford Institute, and so did I, because I did my oceanography there. And he went up to Baffin Island. And they exhumed the tusks of ancient woolly mammoths who was on Baffin Island. Do you know how big they were? The tusks were 26 feet long. They estimate the size of the woolly mammoth on Baffin Island and in, in the areas up in the Arctic were six times the mass of a full, fully grown male bull elephant in Africa, six times. These are big dang animals. And by the way, when the glacial inversion occurred, what happened is the temperature dropped over 200 degrees and they were literally the flash frozen like liquid nitrogen. And they had food in their mouths. In fact, they were French that actually were carving up these ancient frozen woolly mammoths up to the uh, mid nineties and feeding them to people after they're frozen 12,000 years ago. So flash frozen they could still feed them as woolly mammoth steaks in a restaurant in, in Paris. Did you know that? And so they managed to, so people don't know this news, okay? They say, oh, I don't know that. And guess what? This is a fact. And these animals, it's like the movie called The Day After Tomorrow, where all of a sudden there was a temperature inversion. Do you know we have those weapons right now? We could actually cause a temperature inversion over a country or a city and drop the temperature 200 degrees in a matter of minutes. We have those today, by the way, people. The world is very different than what you think. We'll be back in a moment with more amazing news. Mark Gaffney, he'll be back. We've got lots more to talk about.
Are you still looking for that one iodine that you can really trust? A medical doctor endorsed product that is backed by honest research and true integrative science. Then search no further. Go to Nutramedical.com for Dr. Bill Deagle's Nutriodine, proven time and time again to be the very best iodine available for you. Nutriodine is the only Tesla activated monatomic plasma iodine in the world. It optimizes mitochondrial function and generation of new mitochondria from totally neutralizing the venom from a desert recluse spider bite in Southern California to eliminating malaria parasites reported by medical missionaries in Central India. Dr. Bill's Nutriodine is simply the most powerful healing formula there is. Nutriodine clears the body of all known pathogens, restores it to an alkaline state, and even promotes stem cell regeneration. Order Dr. Bill's Nutriodine today at 888 8871 or visit us online at Nutramedical.com. Red Deer Velvet DR is an amazing new product with a patent to preserve 300 biomolecules and six hormones, same as fetal life where you don't age at all. The state of fetal life allows the 300 biomolecules and six hormones produced by the placenta to be supportive of the uh, regeneration of tissues and organs with maximum apoptosis uh, changing the tissue and organ structure of a fetus. That's why if fetal surgery is performed, there is no scar. Taking uh, two to three capsules twice a day with oncomycin, myco D2, uh, provides an amazing support for regeneration of any tissue and organ in the body and even advanced stem cell therapy support treatment. Do uh, get Nutramedical's Red Deer Velvet DR from Dr. Bill Deagle at Nutramedical.com, N-U-T-R-I Medical.com, 888-212-8871. Stay well and stay young with Nutramedical. Hi, I'm Dr. Bill Deagle, MD, A-A-E-M, A-C-A-M, A-4-M of Nutramedical.com and a consultant providing email advice free on advanced protocols for your optimized wellness and advanced technologies to heal and regenerate you. You can contact us at NutraMedical.com, that's N-U-T-R-I Medical.com, or 888-212-8871. You get free email starter protocols of our top medical-grade nutraceuticals, initial testing, and recommendations for your own primary doctor to do, as well as recommendations to give you an idea of a consultation and a full protocol to try to help you regenerate your tissues, heal naturally without the use of toxic polypharmacy. I can send test kits to you as well anywhere in the world and provide you recommendations to referral of specialty clinics worldwide. So contact me, Dr. Bill Deagle, at Nutramedical.com. That's N-U-T-R-I medical.com or 888-212-8871. At Nutramedical.com, we have the most amazing drinks with the best most feel, highest quality bionutrient uh, exposure to your body to heal and regenerate, and the uh, most powerful persistence of nutrients to heal your body dramatically. We have Ageless, which makes you age less, which repairs your DNA, extends your telomeres, etc., we have life support that detoxes phase two detox pathways, glucuronidation, sulfation, and methylation pathway support. We have glycemics that blocks the carbohydrate absorption and helps with diabetes or weight loss, and as well helps with people that are trying to build up muscle using things like our um, special formulas from Dr. Wolf called Mega Muscles Between Meals along with Sports Energy Light. We have the amazing Nutri Complete, the most complete red and green drink in the world with the best mouthfeel and flavor. You can often mix it, too, with Vitamin Mineral Mix, which is our fruit-flavored mix power of vitamin minerals. Stay well with Nutramedical every day. Mark, one of the articles you have here is called The Oldest Anomaly in Science. I'd like you to go through that because... We've got these maps up and everything about your uh, anomaly research and so on. And you reference here about the mollusk shells in the Americas hitherto unresearched, under-researched, a science that supports Charles Hapgood's theory of crustal displacement. Explain what you mean by that. Yes, I discovered this while reading Darwin's book on the geology of South America, which was published around 1846. Uh Darwin, you know, did a lot of traveling down in South America during the voyage of the Beagle, and uh, he, took, he wrote like three books on about his trip. Uh, the uh, it's it's very interesting that this anomaly goes all the way back to the time of Darwin, 
It's never been explained yet until I explained it. Uh, and they really don't have a clue. I tried to talk to some scientists about it. I tried to bring uh, this interpretation of mine, uh, put that in front of them, but I never heard back from them. Um, there, were, there were some scientists working down in South America uh, that c collaborated with Darwin. They, they used to write, they corresponded, and they provided him with this entire data set that they had assembled uh, there, they, we had, they had located these high uh, protected beaches where you had these entire faunal communities uh, of mollusk shells that it, the, the, the sea, the, the, all the land had been lifted up and it protected them from uh, being destroyed by the surf. You know, these types of uh, faunal beds are easily destroyed by the ocean. Unfortunately, right. we had several sites that were lifted up and protected, and the, the scientists were able to uh, study them. And what they learned is that uh, the present range of these species uh, is greatly different from the range just uh, like 10, 15,000 years ago. The, the species had migrated up the uh, north up the coast to... Uh, uh, after some kind of event, the scientists, they didn't have a clue what had happened or what caused this. Darwin uh, discusses it in his book and uh, eventually just passes on because he, he just can't get his head around it. But what I believe is that uh, we have here uh, empirical evidence for the, the last crustal displacement. Uh, we had a movement of the crust of 1,650-some miles. Right, uh, and that is the exact same, uh, the equivalent of the, of the, uh, the migration of these mollusks north up the coast of South America, and they were actually trying to get back to the warm water that they prefer. These species have a very narrow tolerance for water temperature, and when the coast, when the crust moved 1,600 miles, suddenly they were in cold water, and because uh, the crust moved south. They migrated the, the 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 larval stage. In fact, is what did the migrating, not the mollusks themselves, because they are not able to move it very quickly or very far. But in the in the larval stage, they're able to ride the currents, and they were able to relocate 1,500 miles up the coast. Wow. Yeah, and then I discovered that the similar thing happened on uh, in in North America on the North American coast. We had a whole faunal community, and there was also a bed, a protected bed there off Santa Cruz. Uh, so they had the entire community, and they were able to study it. This, In this case, they migrated about 700 miles up the coast to the Seattle area, uh, again, to get back to, in this case, colder water, because then when the crust moved south, the cold water species were pushed down into a warm water zone. Right. So we had this happening on both in both North and South America. And it's very interesting that this is a North-South coastline that extends all the way from Alaska all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. We were very fortunate that these species were able to relocate. There were, it was a continuous coastline, so they were able to relocate. So what we, what we have here is a, a record of a, of a global event and but this, unfortunately, this mollusk experts cannot get their head around this data. They still, to this day, do not understand it. And this was anomalous at the time of Darwin, maybe in the eight, in the 1820s. It's still that is still the case today. They still do not understand what's going on here. Right. So this is what I'm going to be writing about in my book. It's going to be a. a yeah, this I is very really significant. Now, when do you think the book will be ready? Because I want to really push this, and I want to do some more videos with you, too. I'd like to do some videos this weekend. Because I'll tell you what, what, what I I have three layers of knowledge, okay? And I'm a very logical person. That's why I like geniuses like you. And you're a genius at what you do, okay? Um, and I believe we're, although we're separate individuals, we're collectively part of a larger intellectual, if you want to call them, transgalactic and cosmic brain. Uh, what I've been shown is what's called the keys to the heliarchion. In other words... Even when you see inventions, you'll see two people invent things that are maybe separated by continents, and they felt the patent office within hours. There's a connection there, right? And I believe that this is time for this information to come out. 
Uh, and the reason is that there's a move on the dark side to do things that are very bad for the human race and the ecosphere. Uh, and then there's also movements to, to relieve us and to save us. And some of those things are natural things like people prepping financially and physically and so on. But some of them are galactic and solar and cosmic things. For example, we had some near misses with nuclear warfare with the Russians. And the Russian director of, the, of their missile defense actually said that he had some intuitive knowledge that it wasn't an incoming missile or a warning, so he didn't fire off his missiles. There were other times when I knew the director of Missile Defense Command, Colonel Lynn Wells, where a, quote, a UFO kind of object or a supernatural object came in and actually welded the doors of the silos in, in our ground-based missile silos so we couldn't launch. In fact, to go up there, it took weeks to un unweld the doors of the silos. So you have to understand there's galactic solar and there's also, if you want to call transgalactic or supernatural events that actually intervene to save the human race and to kind of mitigate things. Now, survivors, we survived an ancient galactic war. The population on Mars was wiped out. We have to understand that these things are, they have analogies like, the, you know, the, the, the Star Wars or the Trilogy of the Ring. But the real reality, if I actually could put together all the knowledge I have to, say, a movie producer in Hollywood, it would make a movie that would make Star Wars look like a child's play. And it would include things like your stuff about pole shifting because these ancient peoples living on Earth in the ancient empires of Atlantis and Mew, in fact, you know about Sir Francis Bacon, right? He was the illegitimate son of Queen Elizabeth I. Now, Queen Elizabeth's mother was killed because she was a genius, okay, and she kind of ticked off Henry, so she got beheaded. But her, Ill her daughter became the queen after uh, he, came and he died. She was also a genius, and she set up the first intel agency in the world in Britain. The first intel agency in the world, and her son, who had an IQ over 200, was a wizard. His name was Sir Francis Bacon, and she never got married. He was an illegitimate son, and he wrote a book called The Voynich Document in Symbology. And he talked about, in fact, because he had access to the ancient Vatican Library, of the uh, lands of Atlantis and Mew. Now, Atlantis and Mew are real. They're not imaginary. And a lot of the technology that Tesla talked about were because his father was a Greek Orthodox minister. He had access to the Alexandria and the Vatican Library. Tesla wasn't just a scientist and a supernatural intuitive with a super high IQ. He actually had access to the Vatican and the Alexandrian Library of the ancient world of Atlantis and Mu. Did you know that? Through his father. And what people need to start understanding here, there's levels of knowledge here that are kind of percolating through the human race now to tell us and give us a warning that something's coming. Now, I believe that there's a lot of bad things coming. There are like the fires in Northern California, which are being triggered off by the next generation beyond HARP to do space-based weather modification and weather and, and uh, trigger off the events. But also there's good things coming. And one of the good things is, in fact, there's going to be a Earth change that's going to terminate a lot of the bad crap that's going to happen here on Earth. It's going to stop, number one, the satellite-based communication and the Internet. It's going to die, at least temporarily. And a lot of the globalists uh, that control the world through their cybernetic and digital system, which is basically the info beast that's coming, which is, you know, step by step, you know, Facebook, Twitter, NSA, et cetera, is going to end. And when that ends, it's going to stop them cold in their tracks, be able their plans to actually do, you know, earth changes and digital control of the population. Because within a few years, the globalists want to be able to hack into human consciousness. They want to control us. They don't just want to know where we are and what things we like to buy. They want bi-directional access to our consciousness and the intents of our heart and even our present thoughts, just like, you know, uh, the uh, movie Minority Report. This is not a joke, okay? This is real. They're giving us kind of like advanced kind of warnings of this because it's called part of hoodwinking of high-level secret orders. They've got to hoodwink you and tell you and give you a warning, and if you're not wise enough, you're a willing victim of their craziness. That's what the real reality is. So the pole shift, I think, is one of the most important rescue elements that's going to happen on Earth that's going to put a stop to all this foolishness. And it's pretty nasty. And that's why the ancient world knew about this stuff. In fact, they went through a number of pole shifts that occurred that they actually documented with their things. It wasn't just a welcoming sign from space from aliens. It was documenting the pole shifts of the planetary changes on Earth, wasn't it? Well, Doctor, I think that the civilization in the uh, Peruvian Andes was able to survive these events. Uh, 
Uh, however, um, most of the civilizations around the world did not, and uh, you know we had we had to work our way back up from uh, had to start over again. And exactly. And so we these are very destructive events. They are they're not friendly to civilizations. Exactly, and the thing is, you not only had physical events and solar and galactic events, but you also had interplanetary events with other beings. A lot of people think we live in a sterile universe and there's no other planets and beings or intelligences and so on. I can tell you as an actual fact that when you talk about in religious groups, whatever religion, talk about possession, the primary and the lead of these beings are from the star system Alpha Draconis or the amphibious Draco reptilians, the disembodied spirits that are indwelling our world leaders, like Hillary Clinton who wants to go run again for the third term. When we're dealing with these high-level secret orders, they're all being avatar by transdimensional and transgalactic beings. Evil is exoplanetary and transdimensional. People don't know that. They just think it's greedy or self or perverted or greedy or weird people. No, it's not. It's much more than that. And the world events that are happening are also linked. Our weather on Earth is directly linked to solar and galactic events. Depending, for example, the number of pi meson particles in the atmosphere of the galaxies we move the planets through increases the uh, rainfall because there actually is act as kind of like uh, elemental particles for starting rain. And also, as the sun goes through its cycles, it can actually trigger off Earth changes. Earthquakes, volcanoes, and weather changes. They're all linked. There's a kind of a gear link between solar and galactic events and the Earth. Is You know, this is not separate. There's like, if you want to call it gears or interactive formulae for transferring energy and triggering off things happening on the planet Earth. I think the globalists knew this, which is why they were launching star signs in the sun. Right now, if you look at the solar minimum that's occurring, it's a time when it's more likely to have another Carrington event of 1859, which is a big coronal mass ejection. If that happens, it's very likely we're going to have a pole shift. My feeling the next big event is a solar minimum-related gravitonic superwave that will cause a pole shift. Now, I don't know when it is. It could be sometime in the next... I'm going to guess sometime in the next decade. But I don't know when it is. But I really believe that we are very close to the globalists deciding to set up a new world economy where they control everything, including everybody's thoughts, they get rid of all cash, and they want to control it with their giant databases. People say, oh, that can't happen. When I said it 20 years ago, that you're nuts, Deagle. Now people realize, you know, maybe you're, uh, i got an idea here. It's, it's, it's in your face. You know the next October, which is less than a year away, 11 months? The world ID is necessary. You can't travel anywhere. Did you know that? And it's tied to biometrics. Every country on Earth has to have the world ID. You can't travel. What do you think of that? October 1. Well, <laughs> we Mark, uh, stay right there. I want to get a time for you to bring you back on in the next few weeks. you got to come back. We, we, I talk too much. You need to talk some more. I also want to do some videos this time, maybe on the weekend, and, and get your pictures up. Maybe even after the show today, if you have time, I can just give you for 20 minutes or so and put up your pictures and make a nice little video of some of their comments. But people need to understand, uh, we are going to sort out what's happening and what's going to happen. We're going to get advanced warnings, and the human race isn't in control of this. If you want to call it the great intelligence of the universe, the creator god of the universe, and the advanced uh, light beings of our universe are all watching us. The Grand High Council of the Eschaton and the advanced beings are... Their court is in order, and they're watching uh, the human race from either thumbs up or thumbs down. Believe it or not, that's what's going on. Which is most appropriate.